If you like what you are hearing, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Hello there. My name is John, and I am here to bring you a sleep story. So find some place comfortable, lie back, let your arms and legs fall slack at your sides, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. Tonight, we resume the histories and mythology of Middle-earth as we continue with The Silmarillion by J. R. R. Tolkien. Chapter 12 Of Men The Valar sat now behind their mountains at peace, and having given light to Middle-earth, they left it for long untended. And the lordship of Morgoth was uncontested, save by the valor of the Noldor. Most in mind Ulmo kept the exiles, who gathered news of the earth through all the waters. From this time forth were reckoned the years of the sun. Swifter and briefer are they than the long years of the trees in Valinor. In that time, the air of Middle-earth became heavy with the breath of growth and mortality, and the changing and aging of all things was hastened exceedingly. Life teemed upon the soil and in the waters in the second spring of Arda, and the Eldar increased, and beneath the new sun Beleriand grew green and fair. At the first rising of the sun, the younger children of Iluvatar awoke in the land of Hildorian, in the eastward regions of Middle-earth. But the first sun arose in the west, and the opening eyes of men were turned towards it, and their feet, as they wandered over the earth, for the most part, strayed that way. The Atani they were named by the Eldar, the second people, but they called them also Hildor, the followers, and many other names, Apanonar, the afterborn, Engwar, the sickly, and Firimar, the mortals, and they named them the usurpers, the strangers, and the inscrutable, the self-cursed, the heavy-handed, the night-fearers, the children of the sun. Of men little is told in these tales, which concern the eldest days before the waxing of mortals and the waning of the elves. Save of those fathers of men, the Atanatari, who in the first years of the sun and moon wandered into the north of the world. To Hildorian there came no Vala to guide men, or to summon them to dwell in Valinor. And men have feared the Valar, rather than loved them, and have not understood the purposes of the powers, being at variance with them, and at strife with the world. Ulmo nonetheless took thought for them, aiding the counsel and will of Manwe, and his messages came often to them by stream and flood, but they have not skill in such matters, and still less had they in those days before they had mingled with the elves. Therefore they loved the waters, and their hearts were stirred, but they understood not the messages. Yet it is told that ere long they met dark elves in many places, and were befriended by them, and men became the companions and disciples in their childhood, of these ancient folk, wanderers of the elven race, who never set out upon the paths to Valinor, and knew of the Valar only as a rumor and a distant name. Morgoth had then not long come back into Middle-earth, and his power went not far abroad, and was moreover checked by the sudden coming of great light. There was little peril in the lands and hills, and there are new things, devised long ages before in the thought of Yavanna, and sown as seed in the dark, came at last to their budding and their bloom, west, north, 
and south, the children of men spread and wandered, and their joy was the joy of the morning before the dew is dry, when every leaf is green. But the dawn is brief, and the day full often belies its promise. And now the time drew on to the great wars of the powers of the north, when Noldor and Sindar and men strove against the hosts of Morgoth Bauglir, and went down in ruin. To this end the cunning lies of Morgoth that he sowed of old, and sowed ever anew among his foes, and the curse that came of the slaying of Alqualonde, and the oath of Feanor, were ever at work. Only a part is here told of the deeds of those days, and most is said of the Noldor, and the Silmarils, and the mortals that became entangled in their fate. In those days, elves and men were of like stature and strength of body, but the elves had greater wisdom, and skill, and beauty. And those who had dwelt in Valinor, and looked upon the powers as much, surpassed the dark elves in these things, as they in turn surpassed the people of mortal race. Only in the realm of Doriath, whose queen Melian was of the kindred of Valar, did the Sindar come near to match the Kalaquendi of the blessed realm. Immortal were the elves, and their wisdom waxed from age to age, and no sickness nor pestilence brought death to them. Their bodies indeed were of the stuff of earth, and could be destroyed, and in those days they were more like to the bodies of men, since they had not so long been inhabited by the fire of their spirit, which consumes them from within in the courses of time. But men were more frail, more easily slain by weapon or mischance, and less easily healed, subject to sickness and many ills, and they grew old and died. What may befall their spirits after death, the elves know not. Some say that they too go to the halls of Mandos, but their place of waiting there is not that of the elves, and Mandos under Iluvatar alone, save Manwe, knows whither they go after the time of recollection, in those silent halls beside the outer sea. None have ever come back from the mansions of the dead, save only Baron, son of Barahir, whose hand had touched a Silmaril. But he never spoke afterward to mortal men. The fate of men after death, maybe, is not in the hands of the Valar. Nor was all foretold in the music of the Ainur. In after days, when because of the triumph of Morgoth, elves and men became estranged, as he most wished, those of the elven race that lived still in Middle-earth waned and faded, and men usurped the sunlight. Then the Quendi wandered in the lonely places of the great lands and the isles, and took to the moonlight and the starlight, and to the woods and caves, becoming as shadows and memories, save those who ever and anon set sail into the west and vanished from Middle-earth. But in the dawn of years, elves and men were allies and held themselves akin. And there were some among men that learned the wisdom of the Eldar, and became great and valiant among the captains of the Noldor. And in the glory and beauty of the elves, and in their fate, full share had the offspring of elf and mortal, Erendil and Elwing, and Elrond their child. Chapter 13 Of the Return of the Noldor It has been told that Feanor and his sons came first of the exiles to Middle-earth, and landed in the waste of Lamoth, 
the great echo upon the outer shores of the Firth of Dringist. And even as the Noldor set foot upon the strand, their cries were taken up into the hills and multiplied, so that a clamor, as of countless mighty voices, filled all the coasts of the north, and the noise of the burning of the ships at Losgar went down into the winds of the sea as a tumult of great wrath. And far away, all who heard that sound were filled with wonder. Now, the flames of that burning were seen not only by Fingolfin, whom Feanor had deserted in Aramon, but also by the orcs and the watchers of Morgoth. No tale has told what Morgoth thought in his heart at the tidings that Feanor, his bitterest foe, had brought a host out of the west. It may be that he feared him little, for he had as yet no proof of the swords of the Noldor. And soon it was seen that he purposed to drive them back into the sea. Under the cold stars before the rising of the moon, the host of Feanor went up the long firth of Dringist that pierced the echoing hills of Arid Lomen, and passed thus from the shores into the great land of Hithlum, and they came at length to the long lake of Mithrim, and upon its northern shore made their encampment in the region that bore the same name. But the host of Morgoth, aroused by the tumult of Lamoth and the light of the burning at Losgar, came through the passes of Arid Wethrim, the Mountains of Shadow, and assailed Feanor on a sudden, before his camp was full wrought or put in defense. And there, on the grey fields of Mithrim, was fought the second battle in the wars of Beleriand. Dagar Nuin Giliath, it is named, the battle under stars. For the moon had not yet risen, and it is renowned in song. The Noldor, outnumbered and taken at unawares, were yet swiftly victorious, for the light of Amon was not yet dimmed in their eyes, and they were strong and swift, and deadly in anger, and their swords were long and terrible. The orcs fled before them, and they were driven forth from Mithrim with great slaughter, and hunted over the mountains of shadow into the great plain of Ard Galen that lay northward of Dorthonion. There the armies of Morgoth that passed south into the Vale of Syrian and beleaguered Círdan in the havens of the Phallus came up to their aid and were caught in their ruin. For Celegorm, Feanor's son, having news of them, waylaid them with a part of the elven host and coming down upon them out of the hills near Ethel Sirion, drove them into the fen of Serek. Evil indeed were the tidings that came at last to Angband, and Morgoth was dismayed. Ten days that battle lasted, and from it returned of all the hosts that he had prepared for the conquest of Beleriand, no more than a handful of leaves. Yet cause he had for great joy, though it was hidden from him for a while. For Feanor, in his wrath against the enemy, would not halt, but pressed on behind the remnant of the orcs, thinking so to come at Morgoth himself. And he laughed aloud as he wielded his sword, rejoicing that he had dared the wrath of the Valar and the evils of the road that he might see the hour of his vengeance. Nothing did he know of Angband or the great strength of defense that Morgoth had so swiftly prepared. But even had he known, it would not have deterred him, for he was Fay, consumed by the flame of his own wrath. Thus it was that he drew far ahead of the van of his host, and seeing this, the servants of Morgoth turned to bay, and there issued from Angband Balrogs to aid them. 
There, upon the confines of Dor Daedaloth, the land of Morgoth, Feanor was surrounded, with few friends about him. Long he fought on, and undismayed, though he was wrapped in fire and wounded with many wounds. But at the last, he was smitten to the ground by Gothmog, lord of Balrogs, whom Ecthelion after slew in Gondolin. There he would have perished, had not his sons in that moment come up with force to his aid, and the Balrogs left him and departed to Angband. Then his sons raised up their father and bore him back towards Mithrim. But as they drew near to Ethelsirion and were upon the upward path to the pass over the mountains, Feanor bade them halt, for his wounds were mortal, and he knew that his hour was come. And looking out from the slopes of Eridwethrin, with his last sight, he beheld far off the peaks of Thangorodrim, mightiest of the towers of Middle-earth. And he knew with the foreknowledge of death that no power of the Noldor would ever overthrow them. But he cursed the name of Morgoth thrice and laid it upon his sons to hold their oath and to avenge their father. Then he died. But he had neither burial nor tomb, for so fiery was his spirit that as it sped, his body fell to ash and was borne away like smoke, and his likeness has never again appeared in Arda. Neither has his spirit left the halls of Mandos. Thus ended the mightiest of the Noldor, of whose deeds came both their greatest renown and their most grievous woe. Now in Mithrim there dwelt grey elves, folk of Beleriand that had wandered north over the mountains, and the Noldor met them with gladness, as kinsfolk long sundered. But speech at first was not easy between them, for in their long severance the tongues of the Caliquendi in Valinor and of the Moriquendi in Beleriand had drawn far apart. From the elves of Mithrim the Noldor learned of the power of Eluthingol, king in Doriath, and the girdle of enchantment that fenced his realm. And the tidings of these great deeds in the north came south to Menegroth, and to the havens of Brithombar and Eglarest. Then all the elves of Beleriand were filled with wonder and with hope at the coming of their mighty kindred, who thus returned unlooked for from the west in the very hour of their need, believing indeed at first that they came as emissaries of the Valar to deliver them. But even in the hour of the death of Feanor, an embassy came to his sons from Morgoth, acknowledging defeat and offering terms, even to the surrender of a Silmaril. Then Maithros the Tall, the eldest son, persuaded his brothers to feign to treat with Morgoth and to meet his emissaries at the place appointed. But the Noldor had as little thought of faith as had he. Wherefore each embassy came with greater force than was agreed. But Morgoth sent the moor, and there were Balrogs. Maithros was ambushed, and all his company were slain. But he himself was taken alive by the command of Morgoth, and brought to Angband. Then the brothers of Maithros drew back, and forfeited a great camp in Hithlum. But Morgoth held Maithros as hostage, and sent word that he would not release him unless the Noldor would forsake their war, returning into the west, or else departing far from Beleriand into the south of the world. But the sons of Feanor knew that Morgoth would betray them, and would not release Maithros, whatever they might do. And they were constrained also by their oath, and might not for any cause forsake the war against their enemy. Therefore, Morgoth took Maithros and hung him from the face of a precipice 
upon Thangorodrim, and he was caught to the rock by the wrist of his right hand in a band of steel. Now rumor came to the camp in Heathlam of the march of Fingolfin and those that followed him, who had crossed the grinding ice, and all the world lay then in wonder at the coming of the moon. But as the host of Fingolfin marched into Mithrim, the sun rose flaming in the west, and Fingolfin unfurled his blue and silver banners, and blew his horns, and flowers sprang beneath his marching feet, and the ages of the stars were ended. At the uprising of the great light, the servants of Morgoth fled into Angband, and Fingolfin passed unopposed through the fastness of Dor Daedaloth, while his foes hid beneath the earth. Then the elves smote upon the gates of Angband, and the challenge of their trumpets shook the towers of Thangorodrim, and Maithros heard them amid his torment and cried aloud, but his voice was lost in the echoes of the stone. But Fingolfin, being of other temper than Feanor, and weary of the wiles of Morgoth, withdrew from Dor Daedaloth and turned back towards Mithrim, for he had heard tidings that there he should find the sons of Feanor, and he desired also to have the shield of the Mountains of Shadow while his people rested and grew strong. For he had seen the strength of Angband, and thought not that it would fall to the sound of trumpets only. Therefore, coming at length to Heathlam, he made his first camp and dwelling by the northern shores of Lake Mithrim. No love was there in the hearts of those that followed Fingolfin for the house of Feanor. For the agony of those that endured the crossing of the ice had been great, and Fingolfin held the sons the accomplices of their father. Then there was peril of strife between the hosts, but grievous as were their losses upon the road, the people of Fingolfin and of Finrod son of Finarfin were still more numerous than the followers of Feanor, and these now withdrew before them and removed their dwelling to the southern shore and the lake lay between them. Many of Feanor's people indeed repented of the burning at Loscar, and were filled with amazement at the valor that had brought the friends whom they had abandoned over the ice of the north. And they would have welcomed them, but they dared not, for shame. Thus, because of the curse that lay upon them, the Noldor achieved nothing, while Morgoth hesitated, and the dread of light was new and strong upon the orcs. But Morgoth arose from thought, and seeing the division of his foes, he laughed. In the pits of Angband he caused vast smokes and vapors to be made, and they came forth from the reeking tops of the iron mountains, and afar off they could be seen in Mithrim, straining the bright airs in the first mornings of the world. A wind came out of the east, and bore them over Heathlam, darkening the new sun, and they fell, and coiled about the fields and hollows, and lay upon the waters of Mithrim, drear and poisonous. Then Fingon the Valiant, son of Fingolfin, resolved to heal the feud that divided the Noldor, before their enemy should be ready for war. For the earth trembled in the Northlands with the thunder of the forges of Morgoth underground. Long before, in the bliss of Valinor, before Melkor was unchained, or lies came between them, Fingon had been close in friendship with Maithros, and though he knew not yet that Maithros had not forgotten him at the burning of the ships, the thought of their ancient friendship stung his heart. Therefore he dared a deed which is justly renowned among the feats of the princes of the Noldor. Alone, and without the counsel of any, he set forth in search of Maithros, and aided by the very darkness that Morgoth had made, 
he came unseen into the fastness of his foes. High upon the shoulders of Thangorodrim he climbed, and looked in despair upon the desolation of the land. But no passage or crevice could he find through which he might come within Morgoth's stronghold. Then, in defiance of the orcs, who cowered still in the dark vaults beneath the earth, he took his harp and sang a song of Valinor that the Noldor made of old, before strife was born among the sons of Finwë, And his voice rang in the mournful hollows that had never heard before aught save cries of fear and woe. Thus Fingon found what he sought, for suddenly above him, far and faint, his song was taken up, and a voice answering called to him. Mithros it was that sang amid his torment. But Fingon climbed to the foot of the precipice where his kinsmen hung, and then could go no further. And he wept when he saw the cruel device of Morgoth. Mithros, therefore, being in anguish without hope, begged Fingon to shoot him with his bow. And Fingon strung an arrow, and bent his bow. And seeing no better hope, he cried to Manwë, saying, O king, to whom all birds are dear, speed now this feathered shaft, and recall some pity for the Noldor in their need. His prayer was answered swiftly, for Manwë, to whom all birds are dear, and to whom they bring news upon Taniquetil from Middle-earth, had sent forth the race of eagles, commanding them to dwell in the crags of the north, and keep watch upon Morgoth, for Manwë still had pity for the exiled elves. And the eagles brought news of much that passed in those days to the sad ears of Manwë. Now, even as Fingon bent his bow, there flew down from the high airs Thorondor, king of the eagles, mightiest of all birds that have ever been, whose outstretched wings spanned thirty fathoms, and staying Fingon's hand, he took him up and bore him to the face of the rock where Mithros hung. But Fingon could not release the hell-wrought bond upon his wrist, nor sever it, nor draw it from the stone. Again, therefore, in his pain, Mithros begged that he would slay him. But Fingon cut off his hand above the wrist, and Thorondor bore them back to Mithrim. There Mithros in time was healed, for the fire of life was hot within him, and his strength was of the ancient world, such as those possessed who were nurtured in Valinor. His body recovered from his torment and became hale, but the shadow of his pain was in his heart, and he lived to wield his sword with the left hand more deadly than his right had been. By this deed, Fingon won great renown, and all the Noldor praised him, and the hatred between the houses of Fingolfin and Feanor was assuaged. For Mithros begged forgiveness for the desertion in Araman, and he waived his claim to kingship over all the Noldor, saying to Fingolfin, If there lay no grievance between us, Lord, still the kingship would rightly come to you, the eldest here of the house of Finwë, and not the least wise. But to this his brothers did not all in their hearts agree, Therefore, even as Mandos foretold the house of Feanor were called the Dispossessed, because the overlordship passed from it, the Elder, to the house of Fingolfin, both in Elende and in Beleriand, and because also of the loss of the Silmarils. But the Noldor, being again united, set a watch upon the borders of Dor Daedaloth, and Angband was beleaguered from the west and south and east. And they sent forth messengers far and wide to explore the countries of Beleriand, and to treat with the people that dwelt there. 
Now King Thingol welcomed Nott with a full heart the coming of so many princes in might out of the west, eager for new realms. And he would not open his kingdom, nor remove its girdle of enchantment. For wise with the wisdom of Melian, he trusted not that the restraint of Morgoth would endure. Alone of the princes of the Noldor, those of Finarfin's house were suffered to pass within the confines of Doriath, for they could claim close kinship with King Thingol himself, since their mother was Erwin of Aqualonde, always daughter. Angrod, son of Finarfin, was the first of the exiles to come to Menegroth, as messenger of his brother Finrod, and he spoke long with the king, telling him of the deeds of the Noldor in the north, and of their numbers, and of the ordering of their force. But being true, and wise-hearted, and thinking all griefs now forgiven, he spoke no word concerning the kinslaying, nor of the manner of the exile of the Noldor, and the oath of Feanor. King Thingol hearkened to the words of Angrod, and ere he went he said to him, Thus shall you speak for me to those that sent you. In Hithlum the Noldor have leave to dwell, and in the highlands of Dorthonion, and in the lands east of Doriath, that are empty and wild. But elsewhere there are many of my people, and I would not have them restrained of their freedom, still less ousted from their homes. Beware, therefore, how you princes of the West bear yourselves, for I am the Lord of Beleriand, and all who seek to dwell there shall hear my word. Into Doriath none shall come to abide, but only such as I call as guests, or who seek me in great need. Now the lords of the Noldor held counsel in Mithrim, and thither came Angrod out of Doriath, bearing the message of King Thingol. Cold seemed its welcome to the Noldor, and the sons of Feanor were angered at the words. But Mithros laughed, saying, A king is he that can hold his own, or else his title is vain. Thingol does but grant us lands where his power does not run. Indeed, Doriath alone would be his realm this day, but for the coming of the Noldor. Therefore in Doriath let him reign, and be glad that he has the sons of Finwë for his neighbors, not the orcs of Morgoth that we found. Elsewhere it shall go as seems good to us. But Caranthir, who loved not the sons of Finarfin, and was the harshest of the brothers, and the most quick to anger, cried aloud, Yea, more, let not the sons of Finarfin run hither and thither with their tails to this dark elf in his caves. Who made them our spokesmen to deal with him? And though they be come indeed to Beleriand, let them not so swiftly forget that their father is a lord of the Noldor, though their mother be of other kin. Then Angrod was wrathful, and went forth from the council. Mithros indeed rebuked Caranthir, but the greater part of the Noldor, of both followings, hearing his words were troubled in heart, fearing the fell spirit of the sons of Feanor, that it seemed would ever be like to burst forth in rash word or violence. But Mithros restrained his brothers, and they departed from the council, and soon afterwards they left Mithrim and went eastward beyond Aros to the wide lands about the hill of Himring. That region was named thereafter the March of Mithros, for northwards there was little defense of hill or river against assault from Angband. There Mithros and his brothers kept watch, gathering all such people as would come to them and they had few dealings with their kinsfolk westward, save at need. It is said indeed that Mithros himself devised this plan to lessen the chances of strife, and because he was very willing that the chief peril of assault should fall upon himself, 
and he remained for his part in friendship with the houses of Fingolfin and Finarfin, and would come among them at times for common counsel. Yet he also was bound by the oath, though it slept now for a time. Now the people of Caranthir dwelt furthest east beyond the upper waters of Galeon, about the lake Helivorn, under Mount Rerir, and to the southward, and they climbed the heights of Arid Luin, and looked eastward in wonder, for wild and wide it seemed to them were the lands of Middle-earth. And thus it was that Caranthir's people came upon the dwarves, who after the onslaught of Morgoth and the coming of the Noldor had ceased their traffic into Beleriand. But though either people loved skill and were eager to learn, no great love was there between them, for the dwarves were secret and quick to resentment, and Caranthir was haughty and scarce concealed his scorn for the unloveliness of the Naugrim, and his people followed their lord. Nevertheless, since both peoples feared and hated Morgoth, they made an alliance, and had of it great profit, for the Naugrim learned many secrets of craft in those days, so that the smiths and masons of Nogrod and Belagost became renowned among their kin. And when the dwarves began again to journey into Beleriand, all the traffic of the dwarf mines passed first through the hands of Caranthir, and thus great riches came to him. When twenty years of the sun had passed, Fingolfin, king of the Noldor, made a great feast, and it was held in the spring near to the pools of Ivrin, whence the swift river Narog rose, for there the lands were green and fair at the feet of the mountains of shadow that shielded them from the north. The joy of that feast was long remembered in the later days of sorrow, and it was called Merith Adathad, the Feast of Reuniting. Thither came many of the chieftains and people of Fingolfin and Finrod, and of the sons of Feanor, Mithros and Maglor, with warriors of the Eastern March, and there came also great numbers of the Grey Elves, wanderers of the woods of Beleriand, and the folk of the Havens, with Círdan their lord. There came even green elves of Osiriand, the land of seven rivers, far off under the walls of the Blue Mountains. But out of Doriath there came but two messengers, Mablong and Dairon, bearing greetings from the king. At Merith Adathad, many counsels were taken in goodwill, and oaths were sworn of league and friendship, and it is told that at this feast the tongue of the Grey Elves was most spoken even by the Noldor, for they learned swiftly the speech of Beleriand, whereas the Sindar were slow to master the tongue of Valinor. The hearts of the Noldor were high and full of hope, and to many among them it seemed that the words of Feanor had been justified, bidding them seek freedom and fair kingdom in Middle-earth. And indeed there followed after long years of peace, while their swords fenced Beleriand from the ruin of Morgoth, and his power was shut behind his gates. In those days there was joy beneath the new sun and moon, and all the land was glad, but still the shadow brooded in the north. And when again thirty years had passed, Turgon, son of Fingolfin, left Nevrast where he dwelt and sought out Finrod, his friend, upon the island of Tol Sirion, and they journeyed southward along the river, being weary for a while of the northern mountains. And as they journeyed, night came upon them beyond the mirrors of twilight, beside the waters of Sirion, and they slept upon his banks, beneath the summer stars. But Ulmo, coming up the river, laid a deep sleep upon them, and heavy dreams. And the trouble of the dreams remained after they awoke, but neither said aught to the other, for their memory was not clear, and each believed that Ulmo had sent a message to him alone. But unquiet was upon them ever after, 
and doubt of what should befall, and they wandered often alone in untrodden lands, seeking far and wide for places of hidden strength, for it seemed to each that he was bidden to prepare for a day of evil, and to establish a retreat, lest Morgoth should burst from Angband and overthrow the armies of the north. Now on a time, Finrod and Galadriel his sister were the guests of Thingol, their kinsmen in Doriath. Then Finrod was filled with wonder at the strength and majesty of Menegroth, its treasuries and armories, and its many pillared halls of stone. And it came into his heart that he would build wide halls behind ever-guarded gates in some deep and secret place beneath the hills. Therefore he opened his heart to Thingol, telling him of his dreams. And Thingol spoke to him of the deep gorge of the river Narog, and the caves under the high Faroth in its steep western shore. And when he departed, he gave him guides to lead him to that place of which few yet knew. Thus Finrod came to the caverns of Narog, and began to establish there deep halls and armories after the fashion of the mansions of Menegroth, and that stronghold was called Nargothrond. In that labor, Finrod was aided by the dwarves of the Blue Mountains, and they were rewarded well, for Finrod had brought more treasuries out of Tyrion than any other of the princes of the Noldor, and in that time was made for him the Nauglamir, the necklace of the dwarves most renowned of their works in the elder days. It was a caracanet of gold, and set therein were gems uncounted from Valinor, but it had a power within it, so that it rested lightly on its wearer, as a strand of flax, and whatsoever neck it clasped, it sat always with grace and loveliness. There in Nargothrond, Finrod made his home with many of his people, and he was named in the tongue of the dwarves, Felagund, Hewer of Caves, and that name he bore thereafter until his end. But Finrod Felagund was not the first to dwell in the caves beside the river Narog. Galadriel his sister went not with him to Nargothrond, for in Doriath dwelt Celeborn, kinsman of Thingol, and there was great love between them. Therefore she remained in the hidden kingdom, and abode with Melion, and of her learned great lore and wisdom concerning Middle-earth. But Turgon remembered the city set upon a hill, Tyrion the Fair, with its tower and tree, and he found not what he sought, but returned to Nevrast, and sat in peace in Vinyamar, by the shores of the sea. And in the next year Ulmo himself appeared to him, and bade him go forth again alone into the Vale of Syrian. And Turgon went forth, and by the guidance of Ulmo, he discovered the hidden Vale of Tumladen in the encircling mountains, in the midst of which there was a hill of stone. Of this he spoke to none as yet, but returned once more to Nevrast, and there began in his secret councils to devise the plans of a city after the manner of Tyrion upon Tuna, for which his heart yearned in exile. Now Morgoth, believing the report of his spies that the lords of the Noldor were wandering abroad with little thought of war, made trial of the strength and watchfulness of his enemies. Once more, with little warning, his might was stirred, and suddenly there were earthquakes in the north, and fire came from fissures in the earth, and the iron mountains vomited flame, and orcs poured forth across the plain of Ardgalen. Thence they thrust down the pass of Syrian in the west, and in the east they burst through the land of Maglor, in the gap between the hills of Mythros and the outliers of the Blue Mountains. But Fingolfin and Mythros were not sleeping, and while others sought out the scattered bands of orcs that stayed in Beleriand and did great evil, they came upon the main host from either side 
as it was assaulting Dorthonion. And they defeated the servants of Morgoth, and pursuing them across Ard Galen, destroyed them utterly, to the least and last, within sight of Angban's gates. That was the third great battle of the wars of Beleriand, and it was named Dagor Aglareb, the glorious battle. A victory it was, and yet a warning, and the princes took heed of it, and thereafter drew closer their leaguer, and strengthened and ordered their watch, setting the siege of Angband, which lasted well nigh four hundred years of the sun. For a long time after Dagor Aglareb, no servant of Morgoth would venture from his gates, for they feared the lords of the Noldor. And Fingolfin boasted that, save by treason among themselves, Morgoth could never again burst from the leaguer of the Eldar, nor come upon them at unawares. Yet the Noldor could not capture Angband, nor could they regain the Silmarils, and war never wholly ceased in all that time of the siege, for Morgoth devised new evils, and ever and anon he would make trial of his enemies. Nor could the strongholds of Morgoth be ever wholly encircled, for the Iron Mountains, from whose great curving wall the towers of Thangorodrim were thrust forward, defended it upon either side, and were impassable to the Noldor, because of their snow and ice. Thus, in his rear and to the north, Morgoth had no foes, and by that way his spies at times went out and came by devious routes into Beleriand, and desiring above all to sow fear and disunion among the Eldar, he commanded the orcs to take alive any of them that they could, and bring them bound to Angband. And some he so daunted by the terror of his eyes that they needed no chains more, but walked ever in fear of him, doing his will wherever they might be. Thus Morgoth learned much of all that had befallen since the rebellion of Feanor, and he rejoiced, seeing therein the seed of many dissensions among his foes. When nearly one hundred years had run since Dagor Aglareb, Morgoth endeavored to take Fingolfin at unawares, for he knew of the vigilance of Maithros, and he sent forth an army into the white north, and they turned west, and again south, and came down the coasts to the Firth of Drengist, by the route that Fingolfin followed from the grinding ice. Thus they would enter into the realms of Heathlam from the west, but they were espied in time, and Fingon fell upon them among the hills at the head of the Firth, and most of the orcs were driven into the sea. This was not reckoned among the great battles, for the orcs were not in great number, and only a part of the people of Heathlam fought there. But thereafter there was peace for many years, and no open assault from Angband, for Morgoth perceived now that the orcs unaided were no match for the Noldor, and he sought in his heart for new counsel. Again, after a hundred years, Glaurung, the first of the Uruloki, the fire drakes of the north, issued from Angban's gates by night. He was yet young and scarce half grown, for long and slow is the life of the dragons. But the elves fled before him to Arid Wethrin and Dorthonion in dismay, and he defiled the fields of Ard Galen. Then Fingon, prince of Heathlam, rode against him with archers on horseback, and hemmed him round with a ring of swift riders, and Glaurung could not endure their darts, being not yet come to his full armory, and he fled back to Angband, and came not forth again for many years. Fingon won great praise, and the Noldor rejoiced, for few foresaw the full meaning and threat of this new thing. But Morgoth was ill-pleased that Glaurung had disclosed himself over soon. And after his defeat, 
there was the long peace of well nigh two hundred years. In all that time, there were but a phrase on the marches, and all Beleriand prospered and grew rich. Behind the guard of their armies in the north, the Noldor built their dwellings and their towers, and many fair things they made in those days, and poems, and histories, and books of lore. In many parts of the land, the Noldor and the Sindar became welded into one people, and spoke the same tongue. Though this difference remained between them, that the Noldor had the greater power of mind and body, and were the mightier warriors and sages, and they built with stone, and loved the hill slopes and open lands. But the Sindar had the fairer voices, and were more skilled at music, save only Maglor, son of Feanor. And they loved the woods and the riversides, and some of the Grey Elves still wandered far and wide, without settled abode, and they sang as they went. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this sleep story, feel free to leave a like and a comment. If you would like to support the channel further, you could subscribe to my Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to hear more sleep stories like this, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. I upload a new story each and every week. Thank you again for listening, and pleasant dreams. Good night.